Hello, I'm Casey Aiken, and this is 21 This Week. Coming up next, why in the world is Larry Hogan running for the U.S. Senate? The sixth congressional race just got more interesting. Who is Bethany Mandel? But why is she such a threat to the Montgomery County education community? And Lefty Drizel, he made Maryland basketball fun. Our panel of insiders will give you the story behind the story. We're joined by Lori Halverson, a member of the Montgomery County Republican Central Committee and former county council member and CEO of SkillSmart, Mike Knapp. Stay tuned for these stories and more on the next 21 This Week. Former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan made a surprise entry into the Maryland state race to replace retiring U.S. Senator Ben Cardin. Hogan, who served two terms as Republican governor in a bluer than blue Democratic state, immediately established himself as a leading candidate because of his name recognition and the ability to raise vast, and I mean vast, sums of money. Lori, Hogan was either going to run for president or sit out the Senate race, what changed? <laughs> uh, it was a big surprise to me because uh, I thought he had turned it down a long time ago and had left that and was considering running for president. But, um, you know, maybe he saw that there is a pathway if he, go, if he gets in the Senate and is there for a while as a moderate Republican that he, you know, after four years of Trump, which he's probably realizing there's a likelihood it could go that direction, people will be ready for calm and moderation possibly, and they might really want to vote for him at that time. Uh, but now's not right the right time to vote for Hogan for president. So maybe he's going to uh, get through. It depends on, you know, what how everyone feels in Maryland if he's going to make it to the Senate. Okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> We'll see if that political calculation is correct. Yeah, so well, Mike, you know, maybe also just one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, he probably noticed the negativity that Chris, Chris Christie was bringing about and how that just didn't work. And he was bringing on that negativity too. So I think that um, he realized that wasn't a good strategy. Well, we're going to get to that part of it about how, you yeah. know, whether or not the Republican Party is still going to support him. But right. first I want to go to Mike. You know, the smart boys down at the... Uh, National Republican Senate Committee had th had this to say: Governor Hogan's entrance into the Maryland race has already sent Democrats into a panic, with worries <laughs> over money and a divisive primary of their own. Are the Republicans counting chickens before the eggs are hatched? <laughs> well, I think I think a little bit. Um, first of all, I just want to comment on Lori's response. I think now is actually a perfect time for Larry to hold and run for president. It's exactly now, not not four more years of even a potential of four more years of Trump, but nevertheless. Um, coming back to your question, Casey, I think that, um, I guess I was surprised at the polling that I've seen, given the fact that um, former Governor Hogan would be, is the only candidate in the race that's actually won statewide, that he's neck and neck right now with with Congressman Trone and only a slight lead over, over County Executive also Brooks. And so I think that... Um, I found that to be quite interesting. Um, I would think that he would have come into that race, given given how he'd done, with a much stronger standing than 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 that, especially given the fact that we have a contested primary on the Democratic side. So I think that it, um, I think that bodes well for the Democrats, um, which is not a huge shock, as you indicated. It's 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 a it's a highly Democratic state, but Governor Hogan did a nice job, I think, of bringing people together, and I think he has a good reputation. And so I was surprised at how close the poll numbers are right now. Well, it'll be interesting to see, and and I I didn't look. I saw some of those same poll numbers, Mike, and I, but I didn't I didn't you know get you know peel the onion to see which you know group voting group was being was being tested. But this is the question for Lori because Lori, you know, as you, as you noted, um, Governor Hogan had a contentious relationship with uh, President Trump during uh, his his last term, his final term in office, and. Um, Republicans have shifted from the moderate phase to more of the Trump, the Trump <laughs> support. Are Republicans going to support Larry Hogan statewide? 
I think a lot of Republicans are trying to decide that right now. Um, I think they're going to watch Trump to see, I mean, Trump, (laughs) (laughs) kind of watch Hogan to see how he, um, how he is with Republicans because he seemed to, to turn away from Republicans near the end of his, his term. Um, And I, I don't think he will, I don't think he should run as a Democrat because I think he would have lost the race in the primary, uh, you know, also Brooks and Trone would probably stand a better chance of beating him in the primary, but he does have a chance of winning uh, in the general election. I do think there's a, I mean, now that uh, John Tykert has dropped out of the race and supports uh, Hogan, I do think that, uh, that he will win the primary now. Um, but, you know, I just, I think Republicans will come around. I think what the key thing that we really need to think about, people are worried that, he might, um, that Hogan is going to be too far left and he's going to be like Romney. Well, the biggest thing I'm thinking <laughs> about is we're, we will, if we have the majority in the Senate and we get rid of um, Schumer as the, you know, the head of the Senate. How about it, getting rid of McConnell? Biggest, How about getting rid of McConnell? <laughs> well, I, I, don't think, I don't think, I don't know that old McConnell fossil. will stay in. He's, he's getting awful um old and um has I, I i think maybe he'll step aside maybe no, he <laughs> and, um, someone else will no, these guys away. these guys the ego mike mike's the only smart politician ever that ever uh, got out got out their ego is too involved anyway uh, mike <laughs> let's go back let's go back to what lori just set up for us which is despite hogan's popularity as governor some of that bloom is has left the rose you know, we hear some criticism coming out of Annapolis now about the job that, you know, Larry Hogan did. Um, and that, you know, either Congressman Trone or uh, County Executive Angela Alsobrook, they're going to be, are they going to be able to exploit that? Oh, I think definitely. I think um, Governor Hogan did a nice, while he was in office, um, did a nice, nice job of kind of threading the needle on issues that weren't necessarily states issues and could say that certain things were already settled in law. So in dealing with issues like reproductive rights, um, he, he kind of got to take a pass on those things. Well, those are issues that are going to be front and center in the Senate. And so he's going to have to answer some of those questions. And those are going to be challenging. We've seen this past week with with Nikki Haley, with the issues with IVF down in Alabama. Those aren't easy answers for for a Republican candidate to answer answer right now. And I think Governor Hogan was going to have to figure out how to do that in a way. Does he continue kind of in a, in a case of moderation, which I think is one of the reasons he was very attractive as a candidate in, in Maryland broadly. And now to try and go back to appeal solely to a Republican base, I think that becomes a really difficult challenge for him. Um, but I think he, <laughs> from a broader Republican perspective, I think he's the kind of voice, that, mod- that voice of moderation, I think, as Lori said, that, that the country is looking for. Um, but right now, there's everyone's still spoiling for a fight and wants to show you, see if you have your bona fides. Yeah. I'm not sure where, I don't where think he anybody's up looking for moderation right now, to tell you the truth. Both, both sides are, <laughs> you know, are on the ramparts. Anyway, I'm not going to put you on the, on the spot by asking you for predictions as to the primary or to the governor's race. We'll just have to wait and see. But it's going to, it's a lot more fun to talk about with Larry Hogan and the race. But let's talk <laughs> about the next race, which is really important and which is really going to be fun to talk about. And that's the sixth congressional district race. Um, and every election cycle, I mean, I, ever since I was born, probably, the Maryland sixth congressional district is touted as the seat that Republicans have a chance to win. And even though Democrats like John Delaney and David Trone have represented the district for the past six terms, that, you know, for those people in Darnstown, that's 12 years. So uh, (laughs) it's a heavily Democratic seat, probably. But this year, with incumbent David Trone running for the U.S. Senate, it's thought that maybe Republicans have a chance. Lori, Will the entrance of Neil Parrott into the race certainly spice things up? Definitely. I just was wondering why he waited till the very last day <laughs> to, uh, you know, to file. Uh, maybe that was the right move, though. Um, he he got forty five percent of the vote the last time against Trone's money. So this time the money won't be as much. Although I think um, April. <laughs> 
it's April Delaney is her first name, April. Yeah. April. Yeah. Um, she will have deep pockets uh, and, and I'm sure she'll probably raise more money than, than parrot, but we uh, in the Republican party are working really diligently and smartly uh, at strategies to help him win this time. Uh, the biggest thing that got him was mail-in votes last time. He lost horribly uh, with the mail-in votes issue. So um, we're hoping to correct that at this next election. Um, and and it's not gonna, the money may not be there, but we've got the power with the people and uh, people course. really care and they want to elect, they want to elect a Republican. Uh, and oh, if, if Parrot I, makes- I don't, don't want to uh, cut you yeah. off, but-, but yeah. You know, you've got you've got a um, a candidate in Dan Cox who's running for this this, True. this seat. There's some great that candidates is, running. That is, huh? There's there's <laughs> some excellent candidates running as well. So it'll be a, a really it's going to be a, a difficult uh, road for all of them to see who makes it. Well, I mean, um, Cox is a bit of a lightning rod, and we'll see what we'll see the you know. Well, uh, and Tom Royal. We, I want to go to Mike. We, got, we only have two minutes left. I want to go to Mike on okay. the Democratic side because. Mike, there are interesting candidates on, on your side. Of course, the mayor of Hager, Hagerstown, Takesha Martinez, retired Army Colonel Jeffrey Grammer, and of course, the aforementioned wife of the former Congressman John Delaney, April Delaney. So tell me about this race from your perspective. I think it's a really interesting race from the Democratic perspective, especially with as many candidates in as are in. And so obviously, there is a significant Democratic portion and a star, a significant portion of the overall district that resides in Montgomery County. And so I think as a Democrat, you've got to be able to make sure that you you play to that base to a, to a degree. And so you've got to be able to get there. But I think if you kind of take the traditional method of we're going to go as progressive as we can go, and that's going to resonate because I got to get the Montgomery County votes, I think you run the risk of really ostracizing yourself in the rest of the district. And so I think it's going to be really interesting to see which of those candidates can build a nice coalition in Montgomery County, and then be able to be appealing to Democratic voters outside of Montgomery County and really make sure they're spending time out there. Because I think that that's something yeah. that tends to be a foregone conclusion is, oh, if I win Montgomery County, I'm doing fine. And mm -hmm. the reality is, I think um, Congressman Trone showed this, you've got to be out in Western Maryland, you've got to be knocking on doors out there as well. You can't just assume that the Montgomery County votes are going to pull you through. Well, the Frederick County vote is just as important yep. uh, as, as Montgomery County. And I, just a quick question. Does uh, April Delaney live in the district yet? Uh, you know, uh, she, you know, John didn't uh, during his <laughs> term as congressman. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering if April has moved. I, I, to, I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. I, I haven't seen that. It didn't sound like it had given the fundraising numbers. It sounds like everybody's still, <laughs> still, still in, in District 8. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's going to be it's much it's going to be much more fun to talk about again, like the last last segment to talk about a uh, an exciting race in District Six. Well, it's when good, we come it's back be a, from a yeah. short break, yep, it's going to be a really fun race. With all those through in. brash and swagger, put Maryland's men basketball on the map, and and who is Bethany Mandel, and why are people afraid of her? Stay tuned. <laughs> Go back and change it all. I would. I would. I think I'm gonna miss you the most. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Or maybe it's just the little moments. I could go back and change it all. I could go back. I would. But I can't. Hey world, I have a quick message. It's about safe driving. All right, let's go. Anytime you're driving, have the seatbelt buckle tight, both hands on the wheel and your phone out of sight. When not in your hand trying to text somebody back because if you do, your car might get smacked. The moral of the story, just put your phone down. The people on the road will stay safe and sound. Put your phone down, put your phone down. People on the road will stay safe and sound. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome back. The parental rights movement that grew in response to protests by Virginia parents to certain decisions being made by local school boards in Fairfax and Loudoun counties may finally be coming to Montgomery County. A vowed conservative and registered Democrat, I might add, Bethany Mandel, has filed to run in the fourth district school board race. Now, Lori, who is Bethany Mandel and why are so many people taking notice of her attempt to be elected to the school board. 
Bethany, Bethany is someone I noticed pretty much right away when I started advocating to keep our schools open. And she was front and center on Twitter, really fighting. Um, uh, hoping the COVID issue, schools, right? The COVID, COVID issue, closing. yes. That's when I first noticed her. And since then, I've seen her a lot on Fox News and she keeps developing more and more uh, screen time on Fox News and does a fantastic job. She has the gift of telling the truth, even though it hurts. That's what I heard them say in an interview uh, that she was on in December. And um, she's Jewish and she's um, she really has, uh, she's a writer. She, uh, and she has written for um, a number of Jewish you know, uh, um, what do you call it? Um, she's written in a lot of Jewish conservative um, papers and uh, she's been a fifth grade teacher. So she has the uh, experience of teaching and she's a homeschool teacher of her own children. She has six children, believe it or not. And she still has the time to run for, <laughs> for board of ed, which is, um, you know, she's just, um, I'm very impressed with her. Um, and I think that parents uh, hopefully are starting to realize the importance of, um, you know, of, of we need someone with a different voice, someone who will speak up and represent people who feel the way she does, because there are a number of us who do feel that starting school earlier would have been a better idea for our, uh, the, our children's well, health. You know, you know, Lori um, and, and Mike, uh, the Baltimore Sun today is running an article about the parents' rights in education movement. So it's it's not isolated to Montgomery County. And, and I'm a little surprised that, Ad, you know, a political blogger, Adam Pacnuco, has devoted two columns, you know, to uh, uh, Bethany Mandel. So, Mike, the question, you know, I mean, we've, you know, we've dealt with the school board the, la the last, you know, six months, you know, uh, and probably years. MCPS school board has lacked transparency and is, isn't there a need for this? Well, I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing people like Adam write about Bethany or write about anything that's different is because I think there is a real challenge with the Board of Education right now. And quite honestly, just the school system in Montgomery County. We don't have a clear vision. And I think that's probably the biggest challenge that we're seeing. And and it starts at the top, quite honestly. And, you know, so the what we haven't had is a clear vision from the Board of Education, I think, in hiring the last couple of superintendents and saying, here's where we need to go. But we haven't also, also haven't had a vision from, from our county executive. We haven't, our, I mean, there used to be a time when the county executive and the schools were closely linked because we understood that our school system is one of the reasons that makes our county such a thriving community. And our establishing a vision of whether or not it's making sure we have third graders that can read, that we look at our graduation rates, we look at the achievement gap, a gap in a highly diverse school district and look how we're, how we're addressing these issues. We don't have anybody talking about any of those things right now at a high level. So as a result, you got everybody kind of flailing about. And so I think this this last situation with, with the superintendent, with the superintendent being being released, we have to figure out who's going to step in there and articulate what it is they think the superintendent ought to be doing. But at what point is our county executive and the council going to come on board and say, look, here's our vision for where education fits in Montgomery County, and we're going to work closely with the school system to achieve those outcomes and, hold, and, and identify a level of accountability, because that's been completely absent for the last six years. You know, my, my old friend, Steve Abrams, who was not only a panelist on the show, but was also on the school board, was mm -hmm. probably the last independent voice uh, on the school board that hadn't been sponsored by the Apple ballot. I mean, he's very, very remarkable guy. Uh, I'm looking forward. So, Lori, you know. Well, I don't know. I, I would say Pat, Pat, Pat O'Neill was a pretty impressive board member. Well, and, Pat, look. And, and uh, provide a level of leadership. And, and I think, I think I, you're I will agree with you, I will, I will agree with, I agree with you on that. I, I think I Bethany is, that. is pointing out that our school system is now prioritizing activism over excellence. And uh, this is something she's going to help root out because there are books that are that are not age appropriate. And there are things that people are afraid to say, and she's going to say it. She will say it. And she might even say a few bad words. So look out. You know, well, I, I, have to, I have to say that the notion of the... You know that we're worried about the activism of the school system when we have this other moment mo movement called parental rights when we're actually talking about educating children and they've named themselves after parental rights as though that's more important than what the, educating the children really is so i'm always intrigued by that as we're trying to shine the spotlight so i think it's really important for us to focus 
focus on how are we going to educate our kids and make our kids as successful as they can be and not worry about all the stuff on the periphery, which a so lot we're of bringing up, we're bringing up rights because they're being taken away from us. That's the issue. They're being before, taken before, away from we us. Gotta, we got to go to break. But here's the key numbers, you know, and I believe, you know, th this is correct, that only 45 percent of students graduating from MCPS schools are reading at grade level. That, that is that's terrible. And it, Mike, if, if if I've got the wrong figures, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the graduation numbers. I know that at the third grade level, third grade is going into fourth grade, that those numbers are accurate. And, and I've signed on, signed on to a, a letter, an op-ed we did recently, and we're also trying to get some focus on this at the county council to say, look, we've got to make an investment in our children at, at K through two to make sure that our kids are reading at the level they need to be at third by third grade, because the rest of it falls apart if we can't get that done. You know, if you, if you can't read and write. You're not, you're, you're not going to be successful in life. And, and the school board is, has to focus on that and not, mm -hmm. not on pronouns. Okay, this is a fun one for me because uh, <laughs> I was a young man when, when, uh, when Lefter Giselle came to town. And many fans of University of Maryland men's basketball team, spoiled by the successes and the national championship of Coach Gary Williams in 2002, maybe too young to remember when Lefter Giselle came to College Park promising to make Maryland the UCLA of the East. And don't even know what that reference is for since UCLA <laughs> had won five national championships in a row. Five na national championships in a row. So Mike, you got any thoughts about old lefty who passed away at the age of 92 last week? I know. No, I think it was a, it was a sad day, but I think it was great to, great for an opportunity to kind of shine a spotlight back on Lefty and all of the things that he did for basketball. I mean, I think he did his his record at Maryland, his record at JMU, his record at Georgia State. He was a winner wherever he went. He was a character wherever he went. And there was always a question as to whether or not he could actually really coach or if he was just a good recruiter. And if you look at the number of wins that he had at the places he did it, he was clearly a really good basketball coach. And the thing that was too bad, I think, is when when Maryland left the ACC to go to the Big Ten, because oh, that was yeah. part of the storied history of all of that working coming together. Mm -hmm. and, and and Lefty was Lefty helped build that story. Yeah, absolutely. Lori, any thoughts? Well, uh, believe it or not, I've been to um, three uh, Final Four basketball tournaments and was a University of Kentucky grad and my parents went to Duke University. So it's in my blood. And, um, you know, when I heard that he passed away, Lefty is, um, you know, what what a legacy that he left. And just look at all of the coaches in this in our lifetime that we've seen and what strong character they all have. And I've heard stories behind the scenes of what all these coaches do. Um, for example, Lefty would call Dean Smith when he had, um, uh, Dean Smith when he was suffering from uh, dementia, he would call him once yeah. a week to help him, you know, laugh and bring back stories to him. And, you know, that's something he didn't have to do that. And um, so what a guy, what a guy. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yep. Good. He was a good man. And uh, we're lucky, lucky he uh, coached, coached the Maryland basketball team. All right. When we come, we got to, we got to take another break. Stay tuned for party shots when we come back. Jordan knows he shouldn't eat this entire bowl of nachos, but tonight he's earned that right. Because a few hours ago in the middle of happy hour, he recognized a sign. Not from the gods or a bolt of lightning, but from a double heart, a kissy face, and a fourth ha in ha ha ha. That's when Jordan knew he was buzzed. So when it was time to go, he got a ride home instead of driving. Be a legend like Jordan. Recognize your buzzed warning signs and get a ride home. Buzz driving is drunk driving. When I first saw a turtle, my heart was full. Not anything but lonely. We had this like deep connection, this heart connection. He just wants to be close to you and part of your life. Every day with turtle is a perfect day. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. I think everything he does shows how much he loves us. When we adopt a shelter pet, we discover they're a little bit of a lot of things. But they're all pure, pure love. 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 Welcome back. Now with Parting Shots, Lori Halverson. 
Since we were talking about parental rights, I'm going to highlight one bill that uh, we really need to look out for, and it's House Bill 558, which is about the health care curriculum being made a one-size-fits-all in the state at the state level instead of the local level. And guess what? It takes away parental rights for um, you will not be able to opt out your child from learning at, from K to 12 um, or pre-K to 12 um, about the uh, gender identity. You will not be able to, to opt out of gender identity education. Thank you, Lori. And uh, Mark Knapp, Mike Knapp, your party shot. So Mark I am um, honored to serve on the board of the Healthcare Initiative Foundation, which has kind of flown under the radar in Montgomery County for a long time, but is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. We fund um, different healthcare nonprofits throughout the throughout the community and have done so. And Crystal Carr Townsend had been our executive director for the last or CEO for the last 12 years and just recently stepped down to take a new position. And so we're going to be recognizing our 50th anniversary and also recognizing the good work that Crystal has helped us lead um, as we help kind of grow the healthcare network in Montgomery County. Thank you, Mike. And I want to thank, thank you both for appearing, and I want to thank the audience for tuning in each and every week to Montgomery County's hardest-hitting political talk show. For 21 This Week, I'm Casey Aiken. <laughs>